Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming on such a horrible night. Um, I thought I would then start tonight by just giving you an overview of where we are, the size of the business and how we have grown. Some of you may already know, so forgive me. You've already heard who I am. In 1983, I had the opportunity um, uh, to go to Abu Dhabi. My, my training was in refrigeration and air conditioning, and I had the chance to go and work for the largest air conditioning company in the world, a company called UTS Carrier, who are based out of Syracuse, just outside New York. And why this is so important, I actually went there as the uh, head of engineering, and the weekend that I got there, the general manager got the sack, for throwing the head of shell into the swimming pool. So I arrived in Abu Dhabi in the Monday morning to be met by the vice chairman of um, UTS Carrier who'd flown in all the way to the States thinking that he had lost the contract and telling me that I had to go home. And the reason why I tell this story, this is a, a great advert for Scotland. I was getting took to a, a, an oil <clears throat> installation in the middle of the desert, 240 kilometers in the desert. And the, this gentleman's name was Jim Weiss, the guy from UTS Carrier, and I'm not kidding, he was, he was sweating profusely. The air conditioning was frozen in the car, but he was sweating because he thought he was losing his contract. We get out to Ruiz, middle of the desert, and we get there to a caravan. And uh, he said, this is where the head of Shell, this is his office. And he opened this door and he took me in and he said, look, if you lose a contract, don't worry, you know, we'll get you sorted out in Abu Dhabi and blah, 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 blah. And I walked into this room and I seen the, the largest man I've ever seen in my life, this guy called Harold Sturman, who was a German who was six feet six both ways. And really intimidating. And I thought, I'd like to see the size of the guy that threw him into the pool. <laughs> so anyway, we walked in. This is exactly what happened. And Jim, we said to him, uh, Mr. Sturman, uh, no, I'm not here to apologize for what happened on Thursday and blah, blah, blah. He says, and th this is our new head of engineering. He says, but we are planning to get a new general manager out to you very, very shortly. And he never even looked up from his paper when Jim Weiss was talking to him. And I thought, oh, this is going to go down really well. They've already made their mind up they were losing the contract. And this is what happened. And he said, oh, can I introduce Willie Hockey? And I put my hand out and I says, Mr. Stewart, it's a pleasure to meet you. This is what you've done. Scottish? I says, yes. He said to Jim Weiss, you can go, everyone's okay. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding, I'm not kidding. It says, you can go, everyone's okay, in one condition. But it says, you make him general manager. So I have to thank Harold Sturman for everything that's happened to me in my life. But the reason why I mention this is that Harold Sturman came from Bremerhaven. And for those of you who don't know, in Germany, Bremerhaven, the same thing happened to Bremerhaven that happened to Clyde Bank. It got flattened during the war. But what people don't know is, is that many, many Scots engineers were sent after the war to help build Bremerhaven. And he never forgot this. So that was that was so 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 the Scots name for top class engineering, I can tell you, is worldwide. I'm in Abu Dhabi, I've arrived, I'm general manager. It's just as well that somebody that didn't know me make me the boss, because anybody that knew me would definitely not make me the boss. And I was there for two and a half years. But the great thing about it was I went as an engineer, but being made GM, I actually had a two and a half year working MBA. It was fantastic. I learned about a p and I learned about assets, I learned about returning, uh, returning assets. So that two and a half years set me up great for, for coming home. And the reason why I set up City in 1985 was I came back and I said to my wife, Susan, look, I couldn't come back into the tax system, I couldn't come back into earning, you know, it was about £130 a week in paying tax and that, but this time I'd been getting £1,000 a week working in Abu Dhabi. I said, we're only going to come back one condition, I'll come back and we'll set up our own business. So my wife's background was in accounting um, and administration. So we thought between the two of us, she would take care of the back office, I would take care of the front office. And in 1985, we set up City Refrigeration. In the next 10 years, most of our business came from the license trade. So all the big brewers were our biggest customers and we were innovating. So the whole theme you'll hear through everything I've got to tell is about is about disrupting. It doesn't matter whether you want to be an entrepreneur or you're in business or you're a civil servant, but the whole thing where we have made our mark is by not taking everything as this is the way you should do things. Right? So the license trade had set down a standard for 50 years. They thought that worked really, really well. And we come in and showed them, wait a minute, if you thought 
about fitting in electronic panels, all this sort of stuff. And those wee delicate touches um, made a, gave us a name within the refrigeration industry. In fact, so much so, from 85 to 1994, I, I don't like using this word, but we had saturation virtually in all of the license trade in Scotland. So we've done all the work for all the major brewers. The business grew from four people in 1985, turning over £100,000 to a business, but employing 47 people by 1994 that was turning over about six million, but more importantly, was making just under a million pound net profit. 1984, I was approached by two um, PLCs to see if I wanted to sell the business. And we said, no, with no intention. And then one day, a gentleman walked into my office unannounced, a guy called Charles McLean, who was a private investor. And he told me about, you know, management buy-in and doing various things. And I have, so many people might know. So in the audience, 1994, 95, something else very dear to my heart, Celtic Football Club was going bust. So I said to my wife, look, it would be good if we got some money and I can go in here and help Fergus McCann. So in 1994, I sold 64% of the business to Three Eyes, venture capital company, and I invested in Celtic. But more importantly, having a, a big PLC investor owning three quarters of your business, although that I remained in the business as a chief executive, this was a great experience to learn about PLC discipline. So... And also it opened our horizon. We, we just didn't want to stick into refrigeration and air conditioning. We had an opportunity with ASDA in 1996 to look at complete facilities management. And um, we took up that challenge. And that challenge really is, a, is the reason why, what we are today. So um, in 1996, five companies were awarded 20% of the entire estate of ASDA. But each one was in a league table against one another over a two-year contract. As they made it quite clear in day one that the two companies that were, two, uh, were number one and two in the country, two years hence, would get half the country each. So at this time, in turnover terms, we're turning over about 10 million. And the ASDA contract, the 20%, was worth about 5 million a year. So there's a quantum 50% increase. But we tried really, really hard to make this work. And we made a decision back then that the only way that we could guarantee the service levels that ASDA were looking for was actually to deliver the services ourselves. So we decided that we would have everybody in-house. So you not believe it, we employed the exact same amount of people that we had originally. We needed another 47 people. So we've now grown to nearly 100 people in 1996. History will show you that over the next two years that we were number one in every category on, on the the KPIs and on the budgetary control. So in 1997, 98, we were awarded the whole country, right? They decided that the service we delivered was so good, they were not going to go with two contractors. They asked us to be taking on the whole country and we've done it. So in that short period of time, from 1994, 96 to 2000, we, we grew from a 10 million turnover to a 40 million turnover, which is a big quantum. But one thing I should mention here that made all this uh, work so quickly is the, the introduction of 2P transfer of staff. So all the contractors that lost the contracts, we were allowed now by law to transfer the staff into our business. So if we didn't do that, it would have been nigh impossible to go about trying to employ 2,000 people over that period. And after ASDA, we had obviously a reputation of an FM business. We'd completely morphed into an FM company. Uh, and again, we started to disrupt the market. So if I, if I say you back then, we disrupted the license trade while we really, dis, we really disrupted the FM market. I'll give you an example. In, in 2021, um, all the companies that had lost out where the work could be what we asked them because now they'd went with one supplier. In 2001, we were voted business of the year and I went down to London to get an award. And there were 600 people in a room and I got an award and the room booed. <laughs> right, the actual people in the room booed. And the reason why they booed was they were accusing us of going native. They said that we had reduced the margin and, you know, that we were just a buying group for Asda, you know, all of this stuff. And it's interesting that, you know, 20 odd years later, every single FM company nearly in the world now is working on a cost plus basis. So again, I think that was disrupting the market. Um, one of the things that's a big, big selling point of City, the magic sauce, is that we decided a way back then that we would have our own in-house IT team. So I think we're the only refrigeration company, uh, FM company in the world 
It's got 84 programs that works for them, right? Pro programmers working for them. So what we've done here is that we have developed a management information system for facilities management, which we believe is world class. And uh, it was called Mercury back then. I think it's got a new name now, Epoch or something. But there's no doubt that this is our magic source. And the reason how I say that this is our magic source, as you see, as we go forward, the way the company has grown, we've got no sales and marketing budget, no sales and marketing team. So we've grown this business from 100 grand turnover to this year, probably 1.5 billion, with from four people to 14,000 people, right, with no sales and marketing budget, but we spend a fortune on the things that we think are important. Um, and again, this partnership model, which is cost plus, contracting is seen as, um, uh, let me say that uh, contractors are all crooks, right? So the normal um, way of thinking is, there's a, I come in as a contractor, and I'm wearing a mask, and you're sitting as a customer with a baseball bat, right? We're going to go 15 rounds, and then we'll try and agree a contract, and then we'll have in the small print, and then we'll end up in court, and all of that stuff. Our whole model is built on open, honest transparency, right? Best way to describe it to people who are not engineers is, is today, if your washing machine broke down in the house and you wanted to get it repaired, then... Generally, you will phone up a company and they'll say it's £65 an hour and it'll be this and it'll be that. What we say is, is that we'll demonstrate to you the engineer that we sent costs us £38. The petrol that he spent getting to you costs £1.40. The spare part, here is a copy of the receipt from the people we bought it from, was £12.62. The total bill was 60 quid, and we'll have £6 on top. So we work on a 10% margin. The bigger the client, if you spend £300 million a year with us, you don't pay 10%. Okay, and everything is done in open book, right? Everything is built on trust. And this is alien to contracting. So if anybody wants to know the magic source of Willie Ross, that's it, that's it in two minutes, right? Just change your model, right? To be open and honest with people and you'll get more and more contracts. But today, we've got some of the, the largest companies in the world. You know, a couple of examples say with Walmart and Jordan Mapson. So Walmart, largest business by turnover in the world has been a customer for 24 years. We, you know, we have, we're on our third 10 year contract. Walmart don't have anybody in the world that's in the contract, right? We're on our third. And it's all because of the way that the contracts are put together. Jordan Marson, for those of you who don't know, huge in Asia, you know, Hong Kong based, Scottish originally, 250 a year. We don't want to talk about the opium wars, right? But um, these, this is businesses now. If you wanted to invest in Asia and you know nothing about the markets, all you do is buy shares in Jordan Marson. They are everywhere. They're in every sector, every business in, in the world. And we are absolutely delighted to have contracts with the companies of this stature. Our offices throughout the globe, Massachusetts and Florida in the States, uh, Australia, Hong Kong. We have a, it's fair to say we have an office in France, but we'll just deliver a service for, for, a, for one big retailer there. We have not tried to grow that business. In Asia, we're in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Kuala Lumpur, again, all for Jordan Madison. The way that the breakdown of our business now, say just under about 1.5, is probably nearly now a third, a third, a third. So Australia has grown, the States has grown very, very quickly, uh, and the UK and France probably together is, a, is about a third. That's a timeline of where things happen, starting off in Glasgow and across the rest of the globe. Some of the customers that we have as well within these regions. It's fair to say the way that it's growing now, the States is a big, big market for us, uh, probably growing faster than anywhere else. And the growth of the UK, um, I, you know, has, has been slow because I had to send a lot of my best guides from the UK to the States and to Australia. Australia now is about $500 million of a turnover, and uh, Amer America has now surpassed that. This is a model and the difference you've already heard. It's a real partnership client contract. It's not a you know a client contractor where it's all about the legal agreement and let's fight about it. Every, every client that we're with, we say if we have to take the, the legal document out the door, we're finished. Right. And luckily, touch wood, we haven't had to do that. Again, talking about data, the the, the MIS systems we have are world class, all in-house. We have a dedicated resource, so we build a model. We, we come in scientifically, we look at your needs. Uh, if if, if Cali Uni came to us tomorrow and says, here's our FM model, we would study every single bit of data we had for this building 
and we would build a team around that, that you absolutely got the best bang for your buck, but you would have your own team. So the people who look after Cali would not be looking after, you know, a supermarket across the road or anywhere else. Most of our big clients are all in-house teams, dedicated resource teams. Um, and we, for us, that works. So you can imagine that most of our clients are very large. You know, it's, it's 100 million a year turnover, 200 million, 200 million. All in-house technicians, we spend a fortune in, in the educating and re-educating our people, um, training them up, uh, all in-house. Uh, and we manage specialist contractors. So if I, if I tell you about one big contractor, if I tell you about, say, Asda or, 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 or Walmart, we will deliver 94% of all the, the, their service requirements in-house. We will use subcontractors for about 6%. And then we get the subcontractors to work the exact same way as us, open book, cost plus. It's right? so the only way that you can work with us. As I said already, we have a world-class MIS system. We'll get central procurement across the globe, so we use that. Right, so you can imagine that a lot of people for many, many years buying a lot of stuff from China. So we, through our Asia office, we buy loads of stuff that we need here in the UK. It's great. Since we opened in Kuala Lumpur, it means that I'm not up 24 hours a day. Someone else is doing it on my behalf. Uh, and we use central procurement. And we, we manage budgets to strict KPIs. So we have never overspent by a dime, right, for anybody. If we told you at the start of the year it was 180 million, to do everything for you for that year, that's how much it is, right? And we've been very, very fortunate. We haven't had to, to manage, we haven't had to top any of that up. And we manage, we manage these budgets very, very strictly. Now you will get freak things where if you have a really bad winter in the States and moving snow or whatever, but they always factor that in, but the actual fixed costs never, never budges. We look after about 400 million square foot of property under management across the globe. Everything's done in an open and honest, it's long-term partnerships. Um, client data generates a scientific model that creates a costing plan. It right? absolutely delivers best bang for your buck. You know, this is a great phrase that we've stolen from across the water, right? And again, as I mentioned, we provide 95% of all disciplines in-house, right? We are one of the largest private loan family businesses in Europe, and we're running PLC disciplines without the constraints, which is a big, big factor. So we can make quick decisions. We don't need to go to the boardroom to make a decision. As I say, with 1.5 billion turnover, we have no debt in the business, no borrowings in the business. So it's a bit unique to have a business this size with no debt or no outside investors. Now, way back, I mentioned to you earlier that I sold out to get involved with Celtic 1994. Three eyes bought 67% of the business. I bought them back out in 1999. So myself and my wife and my son own 99% of the business. Um, all our global growth is, is, is organic. All about procurement. Procuring correctly gives you a fair greater chance of building. I mean, and the, you, people will know in this room, the larger you get, the easier this is. Okay. Um, but you know, the alternative could be catastrophic. You know, get that if you've not got that right. Right, you could be right in danger. People lose loads of money and your business could go bust if you don't get that right. And we try and find as much flexibility within the governance that helps you achieve this. So we try to be entrepreneurial all the time. It gets difficult as most of your customers are PLC, right? But we try that very, very hard every day. And again, part of the, te the technical expertise within procurement team, right? They've got an understanding of what you're actually trying to build. Right, if the two years are not on the same page, it can be a disaster. We have seen that early on dealing with some new clients where they don't have an understanding that right? you've been talking to them for months and months about cost plus, and then when you start, first day they think everyone's inclusive, right? And it's not. So that, that sometimes can create a bit of a, a, a problem. Buying group opportunity, we, we, we connect all our customers worldwide to a central buying group. So we're not buying like, you know, 400, ton of copper a year, we might be buying a thousand ton of copper a year globally, and we use that buying power, and we do a lot of our procurement on a global basis, again, which drives the cost down. The, the contract is so open book, but it's different. Every saving we make, we show the customer. So every saving we make, they make, right? So everything goes back to them. That's why we get 10-year contracts time and time again, right? <clears throat> And I think that the sharing of data, you know, I, you know with the client and us, so, People up until recently in recent years would be very protective of their data. So a big, big retailer wouldn't want to tell you in case you told someone else. But we can demonstrate to our, 
clients that there's firewalls everywhere that no one ever gets to know what you're doing and what they are doing. Now, even the models that you put together, right? And I, and I think that 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 has helped us greatly. Why are we now talking about houses? <laughs> right. So you may have heard earlier that um, you know that a big big part of what we have done is been trying to give back, right? And I've thought that the housing situation in the UK and especially in in, in the west of Scotland has been diabolical. So what we're trying to do is take the money that we are earning, take the learning that we have using, I mean, I mentioned that one of the, the magic source of what we do is that MIS system that we have, that management information system. We've probably spent about 120 million pound in that in the last 10 years. I'm taking that now and try to use that and all that to show me how to build houses for people that are affordable, right? Especially for rent, right? And I think that for, for what we've done here, we want to build larger houses, so people, that it's not so transient that you're in and out of flat in six months. We're trying to build a lovely home that you'd be happy to stay in for the rest of your life. And we're building them and designing them in such a way that your families can grow. So they're all built mostly as two, they're, they're all two bedrooms that can be converted to a three bedroom, right, in one day, right, at a cost of 300 pounds, right? And also they are all three substantial rooms, right? It's not a... It's not a cupboard that you've built for the new baby that's came along, right? Um, I think energy efficient, concierge service, we're trying, we're trying to you know, start something that's completely new here, smart technology. So what I've done here, smart technology, I'm taking the spend of all these large retailers, some of the biggest companies in the world that have paid me to develop a system, and I put it in these houses for nothing. I own the IP. So if you, if you visited one of these apartments tomorrow, you would see there'd be high tech in here like you've never seen, right? At no cost, it was free, right? Really managing your energy, not giving you a meter that the electricity board or the gas board give you. We'll, we'll put a function in there that can actually say, if you've only got 180 pound a month to spend, we can show you how you don't have to worry about your energy bill coming. That's exactly how much it will be. Using that smart technology for heating, lighting, and energy. All the apartments are fully furnished. Um, maintenance fully covered. So at the moment, I'm building 356 over just over the bridge in the Gorbals. And all of these will be an in-house in guy that lives on site. So any maintenance problems at all, they're all fixed immediately, right? And it's part of your, there's no bills. So you'll pay £695 a month for a brand new three bedroom apartment. We know, uh, and apart from your energy, there's no other bills. And we think this is going to be a, a new model, right? And again, what I'm hoping to do is that if, if I've got 400 here and 600 in Bovo and whatever, we've got a plan to build 11,000 in the next nine years. I'm hoping to connect those 11,000 people so they become a huge buying group. But every single penny that we can take out here goes back to them. I do not want to make a penny in all of this. I'm trying to drive people's costs down. So at the moment, people would say that their cost, people who are living in apartment houses, that are spending 52% of their monthly income in their house. I'm trying to get that to 26. That's the, that's the aim. I hope that uh, you enjoyed that. I, I, I was trying to hurry at the end, and you was taking some time. But what I would say to you is, on top of this, that over the years I've had many businesses, nothing like City, right? But I've learned all the way along, right, about trying to give value to people. And now what I'm trying to do with everything that I've done, that's a quick snapshot of what we've done. Okay, so you've heard that we've got offices across the UK, we've got an office in Europe, Kuala Lumpur, Hong Kong, Singapore, all over Australia, and now all over the States, right? This is all from a business based in Glasgow, a business that doesn't want to be anywhere else except based in Glasgow. We are pioneering when it comes to, to you know, technology. So this, this just gives a wee idea about what can be done. Right, you can be a small business with four people in Glasgow, 1985, and as long as that you've got a goal. But but let me let me tell you this: when I set up this business, I had no plans for global domination. I had no plans to be outside of Glasgow. I had a nice wee business turning over six million pound, making a million pound net profit. Right, it was utopia. And then we, what happened was, and this is key to anybody in this room, whether you're an entrepreneur or whatever you're doing, is that. See if you're really good at what you do, people come and ask you to do things for them. Right. No, 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 no.
the story is, and, and I'm not here to impress, is that we have no sales and marketing team. We've never had a sales and marketing team. So we've grown from a hundred thousand pound turnover to a 1.5 billion turnover from four people to 14,000 people. We know sales and marketing team. What that means is you're doing something right. All right. People get to know us, they, they know of our reputation. Directors on ASDA leave years ago and they go to Australia and they go to America and they remember you, they remember the job that you've done and they ask you to come there and do that job. All right. So that is how to build a business. How to build a business or do anything in life is be really good at what you're supposed to be doing. And people will notice that, whether that's whether you're a professor in here and you become the principal or whatever it may be, just have this burning desire to be the very best that you can be, people will notice it and you will get to a level that you could never ever imagine. On the, we touched on it earlier about you know, giving something back. You know, both myself and my wife are from the Gorbals, we were brought up there. You know, we were as rich as everybody else that lived in the Gorbals at the time, right? But we've never forgotten that and we've always, through our life, tried to give something back. And this whole housing project is about that. Right, because we could see that we're building houses here that we could sell at a profit tomorrow, right, and make a lot of money. But what we plan to do is to make life better for all the people that live in these houses. Okay, we will make money, but we'll make it over a much longer period of time. So we see this as the best way. We see there's a problem in Glasgow, the west of Scotland. We are trying to help resolve that problem, but also at the same time, if you know. If my legacy, if I don't do anything else in my legacy later, as they built a big business and they've done all right, that'll be okay. If I build a business that 11,000 people are much, much better off, that's a much, much better business. So that's the story. That's where we are. I think I've run out of time there and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. I mean, thank you very much, Willie. On behalf of everyone here, I've never felt the time go so quick. There's so many gems there. One thing I'd say, though, is that although there's no sales and marketing, I think everyone who works for you is doing sales and marketing, and you're at the top of that triangle. Um, I think we'll all go away with a lot of lessons, right? Just the logistics of this. Um, some of you in the room have got questions, and uh, my my uh, glamorous assistant over here is going to bring the mic to you. You need the mic for the people listening in uh, on the system elsewhere in the world. Um, so I'm going to pick out a couple of folk. Uh, and we're also going to take questions online as well for Willie. But I want to start with my colleague, John McKendrick, Professor John McKendrick, who submitted not one but two very long questions, <laughs> which is typical of him. So I, wa I want you to summarise one of those questions for Willie John. Thanks. Thank you very much. And first of all, thank you very much, um, not just for the talk, but I think for the aspiration and ambition that you've got going forward, Willie, because we have a crisis in housing in Scotland. It's undoubtedly the case. It's been acknowledged for a long time, and it's a problem that's been getting worse and worse. We've tried ambitious schemes in the past. We can go back to David Dale and you, Lannard, and that's a tradition you're following from of an entrepreneur that's trying to do something for the, the greater good. We've tried to create new communities in the new towns of the, you know, the 60s and 70s. One of the problems, of course, Willie, is that building a house doesn't solve a problem. We have to build communities around about those houses. Yeah. Uh, and I was wondering what your thoughts are and what, what the, the, the community dimension to it that you're trying to create and how we can avoid the problems of your castle milks in, the, in some of the new town estates that didn't work so well. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. You know, someone who's brought up in the Gobbles knows all about cast milk. Um, I was put up to my grand's in cast milk to live when I started getting into trouble. And I got arrested by the police the first day I arrived in cast milk. <laughs> so I remember cast milk well. But no, you're right. And what we're trying to do is all the developments we're doing are so large. So, you know, the, the first 350, 356 in the Gobbles, we're going to build, you know, play areas. We're going to put in... 20 electric cars that people can hire by the hour. You know, we're trying to build a community. You know, I'm, I'm going to do a town hall with every single person that moves into these apartments. I'm going to a lovely big church across the road. And when, once everybody's full, I want to get them all over there and talk to them about what we can help them do together. You know, we are, we are talking to Comcast, one of the largest suppliers you know, of, of, of <coughs> internet. I'm talking about getting internet for people you know, at a price they couldn't believe, right? You know, uh, and, and a service. Uh, that they couldn't believe. Every single thing I do here is I'm trying to drive 
the, the monthly cost for individuals down and down and down, but at quality, not by we have to cut or doing anything else. But the point then I want to work with the with the, the community. So we're lucky that before the, the other half of the development was building a new set of new shops, all of that stuff. There's a new couple of new schools in the Gorbals anyway, but they're not that old. So for us, the whole community thing is is absolutely huge. Huge. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to some questions that people have sent in, a couple of quick fire ones for you. You're quite inspirational, but who's your biggest inspiration in the business world and why? Probably I have to go back. One, one of the gentlemen that I read about many, many years ago that inspired me was Sir Thomas Lipton. So, uh, and I didn't know at the time when I was reading about Lipton that he actually lived in the Gorbals. Right. Uh, although his parents originally were from Northern Ireland, but he was someone who, although he was making money, was trying to make things better for people going forward. Um, people, you know, today, modern day guys, are, you know, I've been impressed with some of the things that you know, like Elon Musk has done and some of the things that, that he's tried to do. Um, because, you know, the thing about him is he, he rolls up his sleeve and tries to do it himself. There's a lot of things about Elon Musk you wouldn't like, but there's things that are certainly in business. You know, to from a guy who was part of the inventors of PayPal, and then to go from PayPal to SpaceX, you know, that's, that's quite a leap, uh, and actually try to solve things himself by moving his bed into, you know, in, 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 into the lab. So Thomas Lipton for me would would be up there. Okay, continuing with inspiration, and that last question was Nicholas Hay, one of our graduates. This one's from another grad graduate, Josh Hollywood, and he's saying um, he is a student, so he's going to ask you about books. But he says, other than Celtic's greatest goals, can you recommend a few books you've read over the years that have stuck with you? Apart from the Lipton one, is there anything else? Two, two great books. Um, um, Good to Great and Built to Last. Okay. Uh, two great books. But, but the best book I've read was The Enlightenment by Arthur Hammond. Okay. If, you, if you're a proud Scot, read that book and tell me you didn't cry. Uh, it's a fantastic book. Even about life, you know, it's a great business book, but the impact that Scotland has had across the world, the, the globe, for the last 300 years is, is unbelievable. Unbelievable. So the Enlightenment, we have a human would be up there, but the other two are business books. Great books for me. Okay. Barry Weldon, who's a student who's here. Uh, Barry, okay. The mic's just coming for you. Two seconds, Barry. Thanks very much. And thank you very much for your talk this evening. Um, I'm here as a, a mature student for someone that's um, came into sort of education without an education, to be fair. Um, how would you, what advice would you give to mature students you know, coming into the world of business to, to make the place better? It's easy to talk about, you know, um, profit and loss and stuff, but there's a, the, 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 the fungible parts of you that, you know, build communities and improve things better for your teams and people. Yeah. Good question, but I would just in one bit. It's never too late, never too late, and you know, and try and what you have to do to be fair is maybe pick up a bit quicker. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot said. You know, when you read about me, you know, people make a lot about you know left school with no no qualifications, which is true, but kind of really no true. So I was 12, 13, 14. I was going to be a professional footballer, you know, and unfortunately, when I was 14 uh, and a half, I got a really bad injury. So I went to school, let's say I was in 1A, the time I was getting to third year, I was in 3F, right? So my whole life was a bit going to become a footballer. But it's interesting, um, but on that, that, so when I left school, this is true, I went, uh, I went to the headmaster when it was time to leave and I said, listen, I know I've been messing about and all that stuff, but you know, I've brought a lot of glory to the school through the football team and all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. I said, so I'm going to stay on. This is at a time when you can leave school at 15, probably none of you in the room will remember that. And he said to me, no, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. I don't care about all these trophies, right? You've been wasting our time. <laughs> you're leaving. <laughs> right? This is true, right? And he said to me, get your dad to get your job as a painter and decorator. And my dad was a painter, right? I said, oh, thanks very much, Mr. McKee. And this is what happened. So I left there and very quickly enrolled in Langside College, right? Uh, and I was in Langside, I think, for a year. And then I got an opportunity to serve my apprenticeship uh, at Turner Refrigeration. And they sent me to Springburn College, right? So, and then after Springburn College, um, when I graduated from there, I say, people, I went to, you know, I graduated from uh, Springburn College as a refrigeration and air conditioning engineer. And I then went to Glasgow University and Edinburgh University and I fixed all the fridges. 
<laughs> so I, I would just say my advice to you would be maybe you know try and you, you need to move faster, right? But never too late, never too late, absolutely not. In a kind of related way, maybe Brian Williamson, who's who's also a graduate, who's here, uh, would like to uh, to come in with his question, which I think we've kind of got a hint at the answer. But on you go, Brian. That was absolutely fantastic. So it was I don't know why we're listening to white hole parties when we should be listening to what's happening in the globals, because yeah. honestly, that is yeah. something that big pat in the back for that. It's fabulous. Um, I was just thinking, I just finished a, a book on um, a psychologist who was learning how to play poker for the first time. And, and she said it's a perfect blend of skill and chance. And maybe Abu Dhabi was the chance part and your customer service is the skill part. But it still demands a lot of you to be doing what you're doing. Um, so my question is, when does uh, Willie hang his boots up or is that a job for the undertaker? I, I thought this was a loaded question. I thought, you'd done, <laughs> I thought you'd done your research for me and seen that in 2008, I was a European poker champion, so, <laughs> uh, which is true. Um, I have been reinvigorated with this whole housing project. Yeah, I'm very, very fortunate. I've got three really good CEOs, one that runs the UK and France, one that runs America, one that runs Australia and Asia for me. So I must say I was twiddling my thumbs quite a bit over the last 18 months, even before COVID. But this idea and what we're doing here with the housing is uh, is really got me reinvigorated and it's, and it's keeping me busy. So as, as long as I'm healthy uh, and I'm happy and I'm enjoying it, then I think it, it may be a long time. It may be a long time, as long as my health holds up, God willing. But good question. <laughs> Okay, I've got my wife still watching it online saying, <laughs> no, you tell me next year we're going off for six months. Okay, I've got one from Scott Booth here. Um, it's about something you've spoken about before, which is paying market rates for employees, yeah. I think, and a sort of fair price for fair job, yeah. etc. Can you talk more about that as a process and the benefits you think it brings to companies? Yes. Um, in, in 1997, when we first started off with the, the, the hard facilities management contract for ASDA, um, I got asked to come down for dinner with the chief executive, a guy called Alan Layton. And he took me to this place up the castle for dinner and he was patting my back every five minutes, what a job you're doing, what a job you're doing, especially in London. So I was like, this is great, That's brilliant. And then I just went like to eat a bit of steak and he says, I need you to do me a favour. I said, what's that? She said, I want you to take on cleaning. I was like, no chance. Absolutely no chance, right? So the guy I'm dealing with every day in Asda, a guy called Jim Mason, lovely guy, God rest him, don't agree anymore. And Jim's every day he'd say to me, whatever you do, if ever I should do cleaning, don't do cleaning. Don't. I said, Jim, no chance of me doing cleaning. Right, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing 100 million a year on FM. No, I don't want to touch that. It's terrible, terrible. And I says, and then this, he's, honestly, as the chief executive said this to me, I can see Jim Mason sitting on my shoulder going, no, 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 right? So anyway, I says, Alan, he says, I says, oh, we don't know anything about cleaning. We don't know anything about cleaning. And I'm trying to think, what can I say here to get him to change his mind? He went, no, no, you know how to manage. Great, you know, don't worry. I said, look, said, no, listen, you guys come in here and sorted London for us. Right? You can never sort London. So you guys had a way, you know, I was bringing guys, I was using London like an oil rig. I was bringing guys to Newcastle for two weeks, sending them back guys to Glasgow just to get on top of what was wrong. And then we managed to get some people in London. But then I thought, right, I know what you say. I said, right, no, no, no. I said, Alan, I don't want anyone working for me that's on the minimum wage. I said, no, I, I, I can't live with that. He said, brilliant, you're the guy to change the market. Right, but you need to find an efficiency so you can pay the what you like. <laughs> right, so he threw in a challenge. And we were delighted back then that, you know, believe this. So we 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 took a transfer of six thousand people over a six week period from thirteen desperate companies. Some of them desperate, right? Okay. Uh, and it worked for us, which is still a European record to this day. This is nineteen ninety eight, and uh, we managed to get all their wages lifted by eighty pence an hour or whatever it was. You know, back then we were very proud. And I, and I need to tell you this: at that time, the churning employees and cleaning was one hundred and fifty percent a year. Right. And I think today we are still the best, you know, we are turning 32%. And that's a record for cleaning. So, yeah, it was, um, 
very proud of that and so very proud of the, the people. And, and I say this, I'll guarantee you that the people that work for me don't get paid the best and everything against everybody in the marketplace. But there's a lot more, more to taking care of people than just that. I'll give you an example. Um, we've got all our technical people in the uh, deaf and service, right? So it happens. Following week, your wife will get a check. Your husband will get a check for four times your salary. And, and you can't afford that in cleaning, right? You, because you just people will not pay you. So what we did was I got the people to come in who we give this big insurance uh, premium to every year. And I asked them, okay, I sent people out to talk to my cleaners to say, what can we do to help you? We, we, we can't give you a pound or no more. What can we do? And the biggest worry, cleaners are, are, you know, are, are more mature. You know, they're all, all getting on. And I said, was it? the biggest worry back the survey was that they were all afraid to die and their families had to bury them. They didn't want it bound. So I took out a, a private death and service policy for every cleaner that worked in the 6,000. So if a cleaner that works for me dies, their family got checked for 10 grand a following week. Right? But that's the sort of, so people, it's not about, oh, we get, you know, we get more and more. It's these people care about us. And that's what it's, that's what makes the difference. I ain't working for us. I hope it does. <laughs> Can I go to Julie, who's got some questions from the, Audience. The online audience, and it's staying on the theme of people, so you've led into that quite nicely and maybe answered some of the questions. Um, so I'm going to combine two from Campbell and Frank, um, who mentioned, you know, you clearly have a, a huge success story with, with the business, but how do you develop your people? And do, do you see it's important for your employees to have a work-life balance? Well, on the second question, 100%, 100%. I was very, very fortunate when I was young you know, even as an apprentice and working, that I always, because I was playing football, I always managed to get the weekend off. And I always, you know, I'm not one of these guys that's impressed that somebody comes in at seven in the morning, they put the light on and they go wait 10 at No, How could you not have done all that in eight hours? You know, that's what I look at. So a work-life balance. But I also think that we do, I'd like to think that we've cascaded. It was good when you're a small family business, you knew everybody and you could do everything and you, you heard, you know, if something wasn't right, you could help people, you know. We've got one rule in our business, right? If you don't say no to us, I will not say no to you. You come to me, you've got a wee problem. You know what? Somebody comes and tells us that the wee girl that works for us in the help desk in Asda, um, people came and put a padlock on the house last week because she had to pay their rates. So we get to find out about that and we go and fix it. And all these, you know, that so that, that you care about people. It's not just about what I, I say to people, if the only reason you work for me is because you get paid at the end of the month, come and talk to me and we'll help you look for a job. Right, you need, to, you need to be enjoying your work. It's not fair. If, if work is just a grind, it's, it's not fair. So I hope that that answers both of the questions. Okay, I've got um, another um, graduate here, um, Brian Gray. Would you like to ask a question, Brian? Good man, thank you. Hi, Roy. Hi, Brian. I just wanted to ask, what was your experience in being in business? Um, if you're starting out in business again, what would you do differently? What would I do? Yeah. This is easy for me to say no now, but the first thing I do tomorrow, everybody would be a shareholder. Everybody in my business would be a shareholder. Yeah, I'd make it a cooperative if I was starting tomorrow. That's one thing. It may be broad. Uh, I think um, the one thing that I should make this is a big, big point, right? If uh, if my wife's background was not in administration right, and in accounting, I wouldn't be sitting here today. So I would say to anybody, if you're a pioneer, if you're a go-ahead entrepreneur, make sure you've got somebody beside you that's sensible, <laughs> right? <laughs> that understands about cash flow. You know, if Susan had a rule in the business for 10 years that she'd tell accountants, do not tell him how much money we've got in the bank. <laughs> right? Although I would always spend it in the business. Right, you know, and this is I always say this is one bit of advice. MD, I don't think everybody's an entrepreneur here. People are just here to listen, not to the kind of life story. But if you are an entrepreneur and you want to run a business, the one rule that I learned from Susan, which I really is, is spend the money when you've got it. Right, don't get and buy a 60 grand car when you've not got the money, you know. And the one thing that, that she taught me very early on was is that net profit is not net profit, <laughs> right? It's no cash. Right, so you might make sixty thousand pounds in that year, but you might only have twenty three thousand of free cash the way it works. So, so she taught me about that very well. And so, having that someone who understood the back office is is absolutely the best advice I could give anybody. Can't do it on your own. 
Okay, I've got a lot of questions around the area of your giving back and this way you're looking at your life now and you're looking at um, contributing. And I think it's a good way to lead John into his second question, which is really about that. So do you want to, John McKendrick, once again? And I'll be brief for this time. The, the, the patriotic millionaires uh, in Davos uh, earlier on in January made a statement that the, the rich should be taxed more. Now that, that's one way you can give back. But another way you can give back is by entrepreneurs investing their money and um, using their skills to address problems. D do you think there are other super rich in Scotland that might follow your lead and do similar things, be it in housing or another field? And is there the potential then for more of that wealth that's been generated in Scotland to work for the social good amongst your peers and contemporaries? I think um, in Scotland, a lot of people, you know, that in, in like America with this whole craze is going on with Davos in, in, in Switzerland last year, when they all agreed that they'd all, you know, give a tenth to their wealth or whatever. I think a lot of people in Scotland do a lot of things and don't talk about it. Right, you know, but, you know Tom Hunter is probably the most high profile philanthropist that we have in Scotland, and I don't know where it would be with him, right? You know, so if we'd more and more people, a lot of us like doing it quietly. And a lot of people, you know, he moved up in Aberdeen, try to give 50 million to the local council, you know, to do the place up nicer. Uh, you know, I'm sure the suitors do a lot of stuff. Look, I could go on and on and on. Chris Van der Kellen, Dundee, all the guys that I know through the Australian Exchange. There's a lot of people doing things. What we don't tend to do is shout about it a wee bit. But I, I think that there's a lot of guys that we've been doing what we've been doing for years and years and years. And it's right since you know, 2001 or something, like, you know, 21 years and uh, just try to do it quietly. Uh, I think whereas a lot of guys want to talk about the money they want to give and they want to, I don't want to use the word boast about it, but they want to tell the world about it. So I think in Scotland, a lot of people that I know in business do try to help in, in some way, I think so. Okay, that's interesting. I'm just going to something else now. Richard Miller, who's one of our graduates as well, is asking me to ask you, what is the most difficult business decision you've ever had to make? Probably paying my brother off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the worst, no, the worst decision I made was taking them back. <laughs> uh, the worst decision. Oh, I'll tell you, I can tell you easily the worst decision. Greed. Greed. At one time in 1999, I was buying, when, when, when the boom came in cold bottles of beer, remember, and everybody started to see nice fridges and all the pubs and you could get a cold beer. At one stage, I was buying more back bar refrigerated cabinets than every refrigeration company in Britain put together. Right. I thought, wait a minute. This guy I'm buying all these cabinets off is making a fortune. I'm going to have that margin. I'm just going to buy a manufacturer. All right. So how can I describe it? It was like digging a big hole down there and going there every half hour with a big barrel with money and just pouring it down it, you know. So that was a lesson for me. Let other people make their margin. Be happy with the margin that you're making. So that's definitely the, the, the worst. Okay. He had a supplementary as well, which I think might appeal. What's your favourite Oasis song and why? Oh, good question. Um, I'd have to say, uh, I'll tell you, I think Roll With It has got to be the best song because I've obviously told a funny story about it that people now know about it. It's kind of a legend on the internet. Um, but I think that that's kind of what I've tried to do all my life. I kind of roll with it. Whatever hurdles come or whatever else happens that I've just tried to go on with it. So I should, I should tell the people who have not heard the story, okay? So um, Noel Gallagher, uh, Jeff Ellis, the owner of BF Concerts, phoned me when Celtic were playing Manchester City and says, uh, Noel would try to come to the game. Can you come as your guest? Right? And uh, I said, sure. So he came to my table at Celtic Park. We're having dinner. And he sat down and he was to go up for his dinner, right? And uh, the great legendary Bertie Old was sitting beside me and he said, Tell me to get a soup, that's brilliant. Tell me to get a soup. I said, what is it? Oh, tell me to get a soup. I says, no, get the soup. Right. So no comes back with a bowl of soup, sits down a bit and says, what a roll with it. 
So, so that's that's not why I like the song, but that's the funny story that, that goes with it. That's true. That is true. Okay, another one which is interesting, I think, from um, a friend, um, uh, Tyler Spear. How has the OBE or knighthood affected your vision towards business and or philanthropy? I'm trying to work out the correlation. <laughs> it hasn't affected anything. No, no I, I, I appreciate them very much. Uh, it wouldn't be because of them, but that we do it, and it certainly would be because of them that we stop doing it. So, you know, I am feel very honoured. You know, um, I think I'm probably, someone says that I'm probably the shortest knight in the world and get knighted in 2012 and going to the House of Lords in 2015. So I, I think that, uh, you know, it, it doesn't have any effect at all with, with my thinking in life and philanthropy. It, well, I'm going to be totally honest. It probably did not relation to how we help uh, royal charities, <laughs> if I'm being honest. Okay, I want to come to one last question that keeps coming up from a lot of the students and graduates, and it's um, around, give us some advice. We're on the verge of making the plunge of starting our own business. Should we do it? Should we do that? Or should we pursue the corporate career? What advice would you give those people who are looking out at a difficult working environment? There's quite a few students asking the same question. 100% go for it. But make sure that you do your homework before it. You know, don't just jump in. Get as much intel. Get as much data. Make sure that you truly believe there's an opening, there's a niche for what you're trying to do. But once you've done all that, both feet right in. All right, have a go. You'll you'll regret it the rest of your life if you thought if you have got that entrepreneurial spark in you, you know, it's ignited. You know, absolutely go for it, and and you'll never regret it. And don't and if you know things knock you down in the early, as long as it's not financially, if things get in your way and they will do, just keep plowing on, plowing on, and, and you know, and keep just trying harder and harder, and and you will get there. So it's not roll with it; it's just do it. You know? Okay, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to hand back to James, who's going to say the the thank yous. But Willie, really, that was excellent. Thank you. So thank good. you very much. First of all, uh, by way of thank you, John, thank you for curating the question so expertly. As I mentioned earlier on, the purpose of these events is to share passions, to share ideas, and we had tonight that in, in spades. And the questions that we had really helped to elaborate some of that into what how solutions are co-created between those who are looking for the solutions and those who are looking to find them. And you were a, 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 an absolute exemplar of that. So you shared your passion, you shared your expertise, but more importantly, it was about how you use your success for the common good. And again, you showed that in, in absolute spades. So Lord Hockey, thank you very much uh, once again. And on behalf of the university, just a small gift to say thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I, can I just say one last thing? And this is something I've only learned recently. Um, if you've asked me up until recently, um, what's the number one thing about running a business or running it right? It's about leadership, right? And leading, right? That's the number one thing. I've only learned recently, right? It's not, it's about inspiring. That's the number one thing. And I'm, seriously, I've only learned this in the last six months after 35 years of doing this. But if any of you have got businesses or you want to you know, bring people to the fore in your business, inspire them. Thanks very much. Thank you for this. And for those in the room, the bar's open. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>